All right. Testing, testing, one, two. Testing, testing, one, two. Testing, testing. Testing, testing, one, two. Give me a few minutes, y'all, and I'm going to get started. Let me send these links out to a uh, few groups and send an invite to a few people, and I'll get started with the presentation. Just bear with me. Give me a few minutes. Let me invite a few people. Excuse me. Oh, excuse me. Yes, I I'm finna go ahead and uh, y'all share the video. Uh, I shared in a few groups. Um, real quick, I already shared a few, but if y'all yeah, think somebody appreciate the presentation, um, share it with them, please. Give me just one more second, I'm gonna get started. Uh, all right, let's go ahead and get started. Man. Hey, Mo. Like I said, if anybody thinks somebody may appreciate the video, <clears throat> the presentation, please, uh, Share it to the page or invite them to <clears throat> this presentation. I'm going to go ahead and get started because I'm behind. <clears throat> man in the full knowledge of himself is a superb and supreme creature of creation. When man becomes possessor of the knowledge of himself, he becomes master of his environment and captain of his own ship, the director of his own destiny, the accomplisher of his own ends. Man should understand himself because man is full of knowledge, and this knowledge is a gift of nature. When Mother Nature created man, she deprived him of nothing. He was given the faculty of understanding all things around him. This faculty for understanding has not been taken away from him. None of his senses have been taken away from him. So there is no excuse for the black man. Bridge on my team, green, black and green, queen, the king, salute, now spring, I see, spring, from the I see, I'm ripping my team, red, black, and green, queen, the king, salute, now spring, I see, spring, from the I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. All right, today's presentation is called The Amistad Revolt and the Fearless Singbay uh, PA Presentation Part 1. This is Part 1 of two presentations. 
Tomorrow I will do part two on my uh, YouTube channel, Kofi Paisai TV. Today I said I'll do part one um, <laughs> on Facebook today. Um, first, I want to say uh, ETM Hotel. That means uh, come in peace. Um, or <clears throat> um, Rene E. Kofi Paisai. Do I do I ooh. Heck a new in. I'm in Ra. Kwa E. Sekum. Fatmu E. Wapile. Fatmu Alafie, which means Fatmu Alafie means bring forth peace. So please bring forth peace into the chat. No negativity. Fatmu um, Iwapele means bring forth good character. So let's maintain good character and integrity uh, in the chat. Um, Modupe uh, and Moriri, which means thank you um, and um, I appreciate uh, our appreciation. So appreciate everyone for uh, taking a little time to uh, rock out with me with this presentation. Again, this presentation is called uh, the Amistad Revolt and, uh, and Fearless Singbay Pei Presentation Part 1, which is two presentations all together. All right, before I get started, this is a phrase that uh, Brother Eni Arrett, Sean Calfani uh, coined, um, which we all use in the Masi Warrior Clan. So this is our... Uh, Let's go to war chant before we get started. So we are at war with our culture. We are at war with our tradition. We are at war with our information. So we always have to get this chat out before, <laughs> excuse me, before we go to war. So let's go to war. <clears throat> my saying for those that may have been following me following my presentation this is a saying that I present every time before I present any information and that is as I learn we all learn you know I believe in this saying as we learn things we should be able to pass uh, whatever we learn down to our families uh, to our neighbors to uh, in our community in our society I think this is the only way we'll be able to grow as we learn things we share what we learn with others so as we learn, as I learn, <clears throat> we all learn. <clears throat> Excuse me, y'all. All right. Uh, just to get some people may that may not be familiar with the Atlantic slave trade. I know uh, a lot of people that watch my presentations are very knowledgeable, so I'm not trying to uh, assassinate any one character and say they may not know some things, but uh, my presentation is not for those that may be intellectual, but those that may also be trying to come into information and may not be clear uh, on a few things. So first, before I get into the presentation, I just want to uh, drop a few, a little information before I get into the presentation for those that may not know about what is the Atlantic slave trade. So uh, the Atlantic slave trade, most slaves were shipped from West Africa and Central Africa and taken to the New World. General slaves were obtained thoroughly coastally trades with Africans, though some were captured by European slave traders through raids and kidnapping. So just a little brief information on uh, the Atlantic slave trade or the triangle slave trade uh, <clears throat> there. All right. 
the uh, Anglo-Spanish Treaty of 1875. And this information that I'm giving real quick, family, is just so when I start going in the presentation, you can kind of understand and follow what I'm uh, following with what I'm saying. So this here is the Anglo-Spanish uh, uh, legislature of 1817 to 1840, the Anglo-Spanish Spani Anglo Treaty. And this specific, I'm going to read some of this real quick, but I'm not going to read all of it. And I'll explain it for those that may not, not know what the, uh, the, uh, the Anglo-Spanish Treaty of 1817, uh, uh, 1835. Um, at uh, the Madrid of the 23rd September 1817, Great Britain and Spain signed a bilateral treaty to abolish the transatlantic slave trade it considered to be four main sections. Number one, the principal agreement for bringing about the abolishment of the trade. This is from Article 14. Uh, number two, from a passport from Spanish vessel destined to the lawful traffic in slaves. Number three, instructors for the British and Spanish ships um, of war employed to prevent the illicit trafficking of slaves from Article 7. Regulations of the mixed commission, which are to reside on the coastal of Africa in the colonial possessions of his uh, Catholic majesty. This is from Article um, 13. In 1833, Great Britain passed an abolishment of slave acts to effect uh, in August 1834 which emancipated all slaves in the British West Indies. By June uh, 28, 1828 and 1817, the Anglo-Spanish Treaty uh, renewed and enforced tightly in the scenes of amendment to the original treaty. The 1835 amendment was signed on June the 28, 1835 by the Minister of the State, M. Uh, Moranis de la Rosa, a foreign sec a sec secretary, Vinska uh, Polystone. So I didn't read all of it. I kind of skipped over a few little things, but this is a treaty that was started, we know, around about 1807. The British, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, they abolished uh, uh, trafficking slaves or the Atlantic slave trade. That didn't mean that slavery, they abolished slavery. They just abolishing the kidnapping and the trafficking the slaves from West Africa into uh, the Caribbeans, into South America, and into uh, North America on the, uh, uh, on the Atlantic Ocean. 1870, it, it took a few years, 1870, 70, so this treaty was formed against uh, Great Britain and Spain. Then it went from Great Britain, Spain, Spain to uh, the Dutch, the Portuguese, uh, and the people in America. This treaty was formed to uh, to abolish uh, trafficking slaves on the Atlantic on the uh, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Not saying that they abolished slavery at this time, just the trafficking of slaves, kidnapping and trafficking of slaves. So this is the abolishment. This is the treaty, the Treaty of 1817. So I'm just trying to walk y'all through a few things before I get started. All right. Um. Um. It is important to remember that there is a resistance through the transatlantic slave trade system, not just for resistance when Africans got to the Caribbean. There is a great deal of evidence and resistance when Africans were the first were first kidnapped of the resistance on shores on the ships. In some cases, resistance involved attacks from the shores as well as insurrection aboard the ship. So right here, we know that our ancestors didn't lay down. I know that we have been painted a picture that once we was kidnapped, we did not fight back. We did not fight for our uh, uh, fight for our freedom. We did not try to liberate ourselves from the oppressor. Some captive, uh, uh, captives, Africans refused to enslave, took their own lives by jumping from the slave ships or refusing to eat or just giving up and dying in despair. Captain uh, Jaffa Bird described the incident in the Boston Weekly newsletter, April 1737, when a hundred enslaved people jumped overboard. Most were recovered, but three refused to uh, save themselves, uh, choose to the rather enslavement. Over 50 major mutinies occurred on the slave ships in the middle passage between 1699 and 1685. So I'm establishing this because anybody that may know about the Amistad revolt and know about Singpei Pei, uh, 
who was the leader on side a ship called the uh, La Amistad, which means friendship in Spanish. So it is this presentation is about this revolt and these group of Mende people from Sierra Leone that was leaded by an individual called Singbe Pei. So with this event that took place in the earlier 18, earlier 1900, there were many other uh, revolts on the slave ships that we don't hear about prior to Singpe uh, Pei revolt, the Mende people revolting on this slave ship called La Amistad. Now it says evidence of 485 acts of violent resistance by the Africans exist slave ships and their crews. This included 93 cases of attacks from the shores by apparently free Africans against ships and longboats and 392 cases of shipboard revolts by the enslaved. Of 392 insurrections, shipboard revolts by the enslaved Africans. 353, 90% took place in a period of 1698 to 1807. So I'm going to be talking about the period of 1839. So there was many revolts before we get to this presentation here. So I want to establish when I start talking about this, this revolt on this slave ship called La, uh, La Amistad, there was revolts before we get to the Mindy people on this slave ship, uh, the La Amistad, which were over 485 acts of resistance where, where our ancestors took over the ships and fought for their freedom. Even one incident where they were where they gained the ship and turned the ship around and sailed back to uh to Africa. Which in this same incident, uh these individuals are gonna try to do some of the same thing. So let's get into uh the presentation. So I just wanted to walk you through the Atlantic slave trade, just a brief information on the Atlantic slave trade for those that may not know. Again, I'm not trying to insult anyone intelligence, but those I, as well as those that may be well informed, um, that watch my videos, and I have some that are not well informed that, that watch my videos. So I have to present information for everybody and not just one exclusive group. So I had to break down the Anglo Spanish Treaty of 1877 17, because we're going to talk about this treaty between uh, Spain, between Great Britain, between Dutch, between uh, the Portuguese, and the United States because it's going to be um, very instrumental. And when I get into the case, which I'm not going to get in on the case on this part, on, on this presentation, but on part two, I'm going to dodge into the Amistad case. All right. So then I had to break down the resistance because, again, this presentation is about the Mindy people uh, revolting on a slave ship called the La Amistad. So I wanted to show you that uh, there was many other revolts uh, insurrections that took place on slave ships. Our ancestors didn't sit back and just uh, be kidnapped or didn't try to fight back for their liberation and for their freedom. They, they, they fought back, took over slave ships and so forth. But this presentation I'm going to specifically be talking about, it changes, uh, it set off a change of, uh, uh, of events in historical, in the historical record um, by this, uh, uh, these specific group of uh, African slaves, Mendy's, and you had a few other people from Mendy or in the surrounding area of Mendy, which is in Sierra Leone, which is in West Africa, um, that with this resurrection, uh, things that transpire in America as well as in Sierra Leone, which is in West Africa. All right, let's get started. All right, in 1839, Slave, oh, hold on, let me go back because I and I hope I may have skipped uh something real quick because I always have to put out a disclaimer before I get started and I don't have the disclaimer uh in here. And the disclaimer is, is merely just stating that I am not a teacher but merely a student sharing information. And it's a long disclaimer, and again, in the disclaimer, I have uh no problem. Um, with critiquing of my information. I have no problem if I am wrong in a certain area. I have no problem with going back and changing the information and saying that I am incorrect. I have no problem with update, updating information if more information has come available that I have no clue about. So I have no problem with that. I usually have my disclaimer in here, but I don't have the disclaimer in here. 
But uh, let's get back into it. In 1839, slaves aboard a ship called the Amistad revolted to secure their freedom while being transported from Cuba ports to another. The leader was Singbe Pei, a young Mindy man, but probably known in the United States history as Joseph Sinqui. And we're going to get into why they changed his name to Joseph Sinqui when he got to the United States. But even for those that may already know, we know that when we was kidnapped, we know that they stripped us of a thorough knowledge of ourselves. We know that they gave us their names, stripped us of our names, their our names and gave them their names, stripped us of our native tongue and gave them their native tongue, stripped us of our culture, our tradition, our identity, and replaced it with their identity. This is why we have black people running around here named Billy, Bob, Suzanne, uh, uh, Jill, Scott, and so forth. Um, the slaves had been kidnapped mostly from the neighborhood of the colony of Sierra Leone and sold to Spanish slavers. They eventually received their freedom in 1841. After two years, internments of the United States awaiting the verdict of the courts regarding their revolt. This was a celebrated Amistad case and the episode far better known in the United States than on the other side of the Atlantic. But the incident had far reach impact on both sides, as I stated, influencing the course of American history and especially developing the Afro-American culture while in Sierra Leone, leading to the inauguration of American missionary actors that trained many of the elite groups to lead national movements to achieve independence and colonial rule. So I just want to give you a brief synopsis, a synopsis before we go into. So Singpe Behpehi is a individual from Sierra Leone. He is the individual that started the insurrection on the slave ship called the La Amistad. Singpe Pei, the hero in this episode, was born about 1813 in a town called Mendy in Upper Mendy country, which is in Sierra Leone, a distance of 10 days march from Val to Galanese, Coast said to have been the son of a local chief. He was married with a son and two daughters. Singpei was also a former. And for those that looked at my presentation, the bundle slash Sunday uh, Secret Woman Society, if you missed that presentation, please go back and look at it. You can look at it on my Kofi Paisa TV or you a uh, YouTube channel, or you can go to Masi Warrior Clan, which I'm a member of. You can go to that channel and you can view that presentation on that channel. And I talked about a lot of groups in West Africa, specifically with the women dealing with the Secret Woman Society, but I specifically deal with the people in Mende. So that presentation inspired me to do this presentation on this individual, this hero, this fearless hero, Singbe Pei who is from Sierra Leone from a country called Mende. January 1839, when he was captured in a surprise attack by four men, his right hand tied to his neck. He was taken to a nearby village where he passed three days with a man called May Ajilo, apparently the boss of his captain, indebted to the sons of v uh, the Via King Mani Saka, uh, uh, May uh, I Jilo gave owner over Sinkpe to him in a settlement. After staying in Sinkpe town for a month, Sinkpe was marched to Lobonco, uh, a notorious slave trading island near Salima on the Galinas coast and sold to a richest slaver there, the Spaniard Pedro Blanca, whose acti activities had helped to make King uh, Saaka wealthy as well. So Sinkpe was captured by another fellow African. And this fellow African was in debt to a king named Siheke. And we know, like again, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. We had some people, you know, had our own people, you know what I'm saying, to help uh the oppressor to kidnap and slave us for free labor. Uh, our own people today are still helping the oppressor to participate in white racist supremacy. So he sold Sinkpe to, um, well, he gave him to over because he was in debt to another king who then sold him to a Spaniard 
named Pedro Blanca, and then he was marched to this notorious La Bunco, this slave, the slave trading uh, a port where they had uh, slave uh, reservations on, uh, a slave fortresses uh, on. And La Bunco, Singbe was imprisoned with other slaves while fresh ones joined them for the two months they were there. Waiting to be transported across the Atlantic, most of the captives came from Mende country, as I explained. On this ship, uh, Hotel, uh, 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 I am my brother's keeper. Uh, peace, uh, brother, uh, bro, uh, Rodney Keys, if you, uh, still on peace, Calvin Johnson, if, uh, if you still on watching, Hotel, uh, uh, San Jehudi Ma'at, Hotel, uh, Les, uh, appreciate, uh, Hotel Senate Lisa, uh, peace, peace, uh, Jamal, uh, Rogers, uh, Hotel to you, uh, brother, uh, Gil, uh, T'Challa, uh, peace, Alvin Demetrius. Uh, uh, peace, 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 Queen Ebony. If you're still on here, so I like to speak to those that I had to speak to came in. So peace to you all. Um, uh, two members waiting. I don't know where. Okay, so uh, most of the so like I said, most of the people that's on that's going to be on the lot. I'm a star. And peace to you, uh, brother. Uh, I am my brother's keeper because some of the information that you shot me. I'm using some of that information as well as with uh, information that I had. I had over maybe about, you'll see at the end, I think I got about 27, 28 sources uh, that I did for this presentation. I put in a lot of work, a lot of hours to present this information. Uh, so p uh, peace, peace to you, uh, brother, for uh, uh, sharing some of that information that you had that I'm using in this presentation as well. So peace to you, uh, my brother. I am, bro I, I am my brother's keeper. So, uh, but others... Were Kono, Sharubo, Timmy, Kissy, Jibande, so is the present day Liberia. So some of these names are also familiar to the family if you looked at my bundle slash Sandy Secret Woman Society, because I talked about Sierra Leone as well as Liberia as well as Ghana. But I, 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 I mentioned briefly on the, uh, the Shabro people, I touched on the Timmy people or the people that they call the Time people that was there in Sierra Leone before the Mindy people relocated there. The people or Mindy are believed to be the descendants of the Mali Empire of the of the Malis that was uh, that was in Gambia that fleeted uh, uh, that fleeted uh, Ghana. Excuse me, Ghana. I mean that that, uh, that uh, migrated out of Ghana or ran out of Ghana doing uh, uh, um, out by the Fulani by the Fulani tribe. And the Timney people here, or the people they call the time people, were already there before the Mindy people got to Sierra Leone. You got Kissy, Gambina, in the present day Liberia, and Lomo, present day, uh, present day Liberia and Guana, where they are known as the Garasa. Some who did not speak Mindy learned the language during their forced journey through Mindy countries to the coast. Most were farmers. And again, as you watch that presentation of Bundy slash Sandy, Secret Woman Society, the, in Sierra Leone, as well as Liberia, these groups of people was farmers. Their uh, economics revolved around farming on the land, specifically dealing with rice. Uh, peace, uh, Charles, uh, uh, Charles Kenny. What's going on, brother? All right. Uh, Although these people were shipped from Lagumbo and marched aboard the schooner Takata, which arrived in Havana in Spanish colony of the Cuba in June. At the slave auction followed the advertisement, host ruins, and Spanish plantation owner bought Singpe and 48 others for $450 each to work on his sugar plantation on Puerto Rico Princess. And we know during this time, uh, the sugar plantations was booming. So we knew our ancestors was killed out of, kidnapped out of West Africa and took into the Caribbean uh, on, the, uh, on, on the islands uh, on these sugar plantations to work uh, for uh, these Europeans. And um, um, I wanted to say something else, but I don't, lost train of thought. Um, and another Cuba port 300 miles from Havana. Pedro Montez, another Spaniard, bought 
for the same port bought four children, three girls, and one boy. So keep that in mind. So we know Horse Ruins, he bought 48 slaves or 49 slaves for $450. Then you had another Spaniard, uh, Pedro Montes, who bought four children. He bought three girls and he bought one boy. And this one boy is going to become important in the chain of events that happened during the Amistad revolt, as well as them getting into America. All right. The two Cuban plantation owners obtained fraudulent passports for their human property from the captain general passports that would allow them to transport their black Ladinos, which are slaves, to Puerto Rico princes by the sea. It says two Cubans. So we know that whole, they're talking about Horace Ruins and they're talking about Pedro Montes, who actually got fraudulent passports. Why would these individuals get fraudulent passports? Again, I showed you earlier on a slide called the Anglo slash, uh, I mean, uh, Anglo slash Spanish Treaty of 1817 and 1835 the abolishment of trafficking slaves on the Atlantic coast. So at this time of 1839, trafficking slaves was illegal to traffic slaves. So they would do certain things in order to go, because they could, they was, it was illegal now, they could own slaves because slavery was not abolished, but they could not kidnap any slaves and bring them from West Africa to another place. It was illegal to traffic them on the shores. So these guys will get fraudulent passports, birth certificates, and so forth, and we'll get more into that deeper into the presentation. The passports contain descriptions of each black along with a false Spanish name that they had been given by their purchaser. On June the 28th, 1839, the Spanish duns loaded the Africans on a charter to mass black schooners called the Amistad. At first in La Combo, they was at this notorious uh, uh, plantation. And they went on to what they would call, they went on to the Taracata. You can see here on this picture, they are being loaded onto this schooner ship. This schooner ship was called the Tokara. And we know if you looked at some of my other presentations, I explained to you that it was a place that they went to in order to this auction. It was this auction that they went to once they kidnapped the slaves. They would designate them to another place where they would be sold at these auctions, where they would grease them with this certain type of uh, grease uh, and so forth to be sold uh, to the highest bidder and then travel off into wherever they was going to go, where is the Caribbean, where is South America, where is uh, North America, and so forth. All right, so on June the 28th, 1839, the Spanish Duns loaded the Africans on a chartered two-mast black schooner called the Amistad. Although they had papers, Montez and Ruins, who Ruins, who he, he, he had, remember he bought four children, three girls and one boy. And Kel is the individual who they call the young boy. He's going to be, become very instrumental uh, with Singpe with Sing Pei Pehi uh, doing this whole thing and ruins who bought 49, who bought 48 slaves plus Sing Pei uh, for $450. The vessel was subject to search by British slave pay, pay, uh, patrol boats. The paper, hold on, I'm sorry. The paper showing the captives to be Ladinos or legal slaves born in Spanish territory. So again, these individuals created these fraudulent passports and birth certificate because at this time of 1839, it was illegal to traffic, to kidnap and traffic slaves across the Atlantic coast. So these guys would take, do all types of illegal things, even though kidnapping and having people was in, illegal and immoral too, um, um, to get by. So they would change all these things up to make that, when they was transporting these slaves, if they got uh, stopped by the patrol the, or the coast guards or whoever they were that was uh, cruising up and down the Atlantic Ocean and got stopped, they had this fraudulent paperwork to 
show them that these were actually slaves that was born uh, in, in, on the Spanish territory and these individuals was not kidnapped, forced on a boat, and then now setting sail to a new land or a new territory that they have no clue about. Would not fool the consensitive enforce of the anti-important treaty. None of these slaves spoke Spanish, and the children were far too young to have been born in Cuba before 1820. At midnight, the Amistad kept captains by Raymond Farrell sailed out the Havana Harbor with his cargo of 53 slaves and about 40,000 in provision. Schooner, because I talked about the Torricotta, which they was put on to, that was in La Colombo, which was a, uh, a notorious plantation. I mean, notorious, uh, 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 yeah, a plantation, uh, 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 a plantation infrastructure. And then they was put on, uh, loaded up, and put on after they uh, got to the auction place. And these slaves were sold. They boarded another schooner ship called the La Amistad, which means friendship. And the schooners. The schooner is a type of sailing vessel with fours and aft sails on two or more masks. The most common type has two masks, the foremost being short than the main, while the schooner was originally gaff rig modern schooners, typically carrying the Bermuda rig. Although most associated with North America, schooners were first used by the Dutch in 1816 and the 17th century. I'm adding this in here because when you go back to the previous slide that I had, we had the Captain Farrell, uh, 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 Raymond Farrell, who bought a De La Amistad from someone in the United States. And he bought it from the United States. But these schooner ships were setting sail on the Atlantic Ocean before the 1800s, during the 16th and the 17th century by the Dutch. They were further developed in North America from earlier 18th century. So they uh, was developed more or they added more technology or advanced the schooner ships in North America or what we call the United States of America and came into existence in the use in New England. Schooners were popularly in trade requiring speed and windward ability such as slave, pirating, blockades, runnings, and offshore fishing. For those that may want to know more about these slave ships and the technology of these slave ships, you can look at, you can go to Massey Warrior Clan channel, or you can go to my brother, Eni Haret, uh, you, uh, Facebook uh, page, and look up his technology video on the uh, these ships. And he breaks down uh, each thing of these ships, because prior to the Portuguese, cre uh, and prior to... Um, um, I can't even think of this, the wicked Portuguese name, Prince, uh, uh, Prince Henry, prior to Prince Henry and his institutions of setting up these institutions to, treat, uh, uh, to develop the technology uh, and to advance the ships, no one was setting sail across the Atlantic Ocean. We had boats, but we did not have the technology to set sails farther off into the Atlantic Ocean until the Portuguese began to create this technology. They charted the Amistad from Raymond Farrell, who was both owners of the owners and captain. Apart from the 53 Africans, the three Spaniard owners, the schooners, carried a crew comprised of the master, Farrell, his two black slaves, Antonio, the cabin boy, and Celestio, the cook, and two white seamen. The ship also carried a cargo of dishes, clothes, jewelry, and various luxury items into their staple. The cargo was injured, uh, uh, insured for $40,000. Ruins uh, insured his 49 slaves for $20,000. And I'm going to come back later on sometime, and I'm going to expose some of these insurance companies that have developed their wealth by insuring human beings by insuring and one insurance company that I had uh, for maybe eight years, a life insurance company. Once I found out 
who this life a company was, how it was established, how it how it gained its how its owners gained its wealth and so forth. It was due to writing policies for our ancestors, writing policies for human beings. So we I'm going to expose a lot of these uh, insurance companies that are still in existence to today that gain their wealth off of kidnapping human beings and working them for free labor. Ruins insured his 49 slaves for $20,000, while Montez insured his four children for $1,300. For the Africans, the voyage was to be endured, not enjoyed. Crew members placed iron collars around the necks of each slave. They connected each collar by the chains, you can see, to another slave, and whole strings of collars they chained to the wall. The Africans were kept in a suffocating heat of the whole most of the voyage. Time on deck was limited to meals and a brief uh, relief breaks taking a few at a time. And we can validate this also through another European who was on the ships, on many ships, and I can't remember his name now, but it's on my Kofi Paisa channel, where I went through his book, where he documented and recorded he was there on the slave ships to exercise these uh, kidnapped victims, our ancestors, to make sure they was in shape before they were sold or before they got to the plantation. They wanted their livestock, as they call them, to be in shape. So he was there and he documented when they was uh, 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 laying down or they had buckets where they had to go and defecate and some couldn't even get there because of the chains wouldn't reach to the bucket in order for them to use the bathroom and the tremendous heat down below the ship where it was suffocating a lot of the ancestors that was down aboard the ship. So I can't think of the individual name. If it comes to me in a second, his name, I'll give you his name uh, and give you the name of the book. If not, you can go back to my uh, uh, my channel. Just scroll down till you see something. Well, I, I can't even remember what the title of, but I actually read some inserts out of his books. And this individual eventually became an uh, abolishist later on in uh, later on in time. Depending on uh, where you're coming from, it doesn't take technology to advance boats to cross the Atlantic. Anthony Smith crossed the Atlantic in the raft uh, with no motor and one sail. The current takes you right to South America. Okay, um, I am my brother's keeper. What year was this? Um, was this prior to Prince Henry uh, and the Portuguese? Uh, was it prior to? Uh, his institution and the developing of the technology of these different boats, the schooner and so forth. Uh, was it before then? If it uh, if it is, can you uh, shoot it uh, shoot it to me? But prior, for far as I know, prior to Prince Henry and the Portuguese, we had boats, but we had we didn't have the technology to set sail across the Atlantic because it took months to get to another continent. It didn't take a day or two. It took months to get there. All right. The saddest joke turned to the Africans to uh, thought of immunity. One of the captives in the physical impression, 25-year-old named Cinque, used sign language to ask the ship cook, Celestino, what would happen to them when they reached the destination. Celestino, who Celestino was one of the European, well, or the captain, Pharaoh's cook. And then you had another one, Antonio, who was a cabin boy. They worked on the La Amistad for three years. So uh, Celestino told Singbe Pe'e a joke. Celestino smiled and pointed to a nearby pile of beef, indicating with his hand, Celestino told Singbe, who is Singbe Pe'e that the slaves would have their throats slit, be chopped into pieces, salted and eaten by dried meat. So Celestino told them a joke that the Spaniards was going to eat them. And watch what happened to Celestino. <laughs> Cinque or Cinque 
Pei, who had seen the barbari barbarians, I mean barbarians of the Middle Passage, believed him. The startled new land leads Sing Pei Pei to call a conference among the slaves on their third day at sea. On one of the slaves, a boy named Keeney, later recanted what happened. We feel bad. We ask uh, Sing Pei Pei what to do. Sink Pei says, uh, me think and by and by I tell you. Sink Pei then said, if we do nothing, we will be killed. We may as well die in trying to be free as to be killed and eaten. So after Celestino told this joke to Sink Pei that he and the others will be eaten by these Spaniards. Sink Pei discussed it with other people and he set off and uh, he set off the uh revolt uh on this la amistad the revolt the trip to porto porto princess used usually took three days but the wind were adverse three days out at sea on june the 30th sink pay used a loose spike he had removed from the deck to unshackle himself and his fellow slaves he used a nail to actually free himself and free the others that was on this La Amistad slave ship. They had been whipped and mistreated and at one point made them believe that they would be, excuse me, be killed for supper and arrival. Sipe armed himself and the others with a cane knife. These fools at the bottom of the ship where they was at with all the other cargo had these knives uh, open. I guess they assumed that <clears throat> they were secure. <clears throat> Our ancestors were secure uh, and was not going to uh, be able to get free from the sh from the shackles and so forth. Sinpei armed themselves and others with the cane knife found in the cargo hold. He then led them on a deck where they killed captains Pharaoh and the cook. Celestio and wounded the Spaniard Montez. So they killed the captain of the ship and they killed uh, uh, Cestilinio. Cestilinio was the cook of the captain. And he was the one that actually threw the joke out of there as the Spaniard was going to actually kill them, chop them up, and cook them for dinner. So they killed this uh, the, uh, the cook uh, who also uh, was enslaved and uh, was owned by the captain as well as the cabin boy Antonio, which we'll talk about a little bit later because we ain't gonna hear too much about Antonio. I had to dig a little bit farther in order to figure out what happened to Antonio uh, through the historical record. But Sinkbank spared Montez life together with those of Ruin and Antonio, the cabin boy. The mutineers lost two of their own parties killed by, killed by Captain Farrell. They two white seamen managed to escape from the Amistad in a small boat. So two during the revolt at this point in time, only two of the African slaves of the African kidnappies was killed by Pharaoh or the captain Pharaoh before he was killed and his cabin and, and his cook, uh, uh, Celestino, uh, were, uh, were killed. So now we're down from 53 uh, enslaved kidnapped. A uh, kidnappees to 51. The mutiny has succeeded. The Africans controlled the Amistad. Sing Pei, Pei ordered Montez to head east across the Atlantic to Africa. So Sing Pei was the one who initiated this revolt or this insurrection on this La Amistad ship. They looked at Sing Pei, Pei who were also looked at the highest esteem when he was in his town, Mandy, uh, 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 amongst this Mindy people in Sierra Leone, due to some stories that was told of him killing a wild beast or killing this beast um, at this time. So the Amistad, so he told them to sell the La Amistad ship back to Africa. He knew that the sun rises in the east. And he knew what direction they was going into. So he wanted them to turn around and go east toward the sun, where the sun rises at. 
The Amistad drifted off Long Island, New York, in the late August of 1839. Sinpei others went ashore to trade for food and supplies and negotiate with the local seamen to take them back to Africa. Now, here, before I go any further, I have a lit map here, and you can see them leaving Cuba, and you can see the zigzag. This is how the ship went back and forth, back and forth. During the time of Montez traveling on the ship, Sinpei wanted him to turn the ship around and sail back east because he knows the sun rises in the east and they was going in the other direction. So at nighttime, Montez or the Spaniards would turn the ship around and would, would go back the other way and they will figure out the next day that they was going in the wrong direction. So you can see here uh, the path uh, of the ship in a zigzag motion going back and forth, back and forth, because uh, Montez was trying to trick them at nighttime to head in a different uh, direction. So they ended up drifting on to, uh, into America, and they was headed to Puerto Rico Princess, but they ended up, which was going to be a three-day uh, trip, which turned into a two-month trip. So they was on the Atlantic Ocean for two months on the Atlantic Ocean until they arrived in the United States of America on the uh, where they where the Amistad drifted off uh, Long Island, which is in New York, uh, in uh, August of 1839. Sinpei and others went ashore to trade for food and supplies and to negotiate with the local seamen to take them back to Africa. Uh, which was a, a a captain named Captain Henry, who they tried to uh, communicate with him through sign language because they could not speak English because these were people from Sierra Leone and also from Liberia. Majority of them, over majority of them was from Mindy and they spoke Mindy. And the few that was not from Mindy, uh, that did not speak the Mindy language, they learned how to speak the language while on board the La Amistad at this time. So they was trying to communicate with a uh, captain named Captain Henry, uh, uh, Captain Henry Green, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, through sign language to uh, get them back to uh, Africa. And they was going to exchange uh, the valuable goods that I went over on another slide that not only the, the uh, slaves were there or the kidnapped victims were there, they had other items on board that they was willing to give this captain in order for them to board the ship to send them back to uh, their homeland. News uh, soon got around about the mystery ships in the neighborhood with her sails nearby all blown to pieces. It was a long, a low black schooner, the stories of which had been appeared in the newspapers in previous weeks as the ship cruised northeast along the U.S. coastal line, reports said the Cuban slaves had revolted and killed the crew and Spanish, Spanish ships and were roaming the Atlantic as uh, buccaneers. So this was some of the information that was presented uh, in the newspaper. I'm going to show y'all some primaries. I'm going to show y'all some news clippings. I'll show y'all some letters and, um, and so forth that I've retrieved. All right. In August of 20, August the 26th, the United States Survey Brig Washington. This is the uh, the, uh, the USS Washington or the Brig Washington ship here, under command of Lieutenant Commander Thomas R. Uh, Jetney, sighted the batter schooners near the Colonial Points on the eastern tip of Long Island. The United States Navy and the Customs Service had previously issued orders for the captures of the ships. And the commander got me seized the Amistad and took her into tow in New London, Connecticut. Arriving there the following day, Gagney sent a message at once to the United States Marshal of the New Haven, who in turn notified the United States District Attorney, Judge Andrew Johnson. The later, we're going to talk about Judge Andrew Johnson a little bit. The later was certainly no friend of, of the black man. From in 1833, he had prosecuted of uh, Miss Produce uh, Crandell for admitting Negroes into her school in the uh, Canterbury, uh, Connecticut. All right. New York's son witnessed Sinkpay defiance of his captors 
and repeated an attempt to escape. Syncpe jumped overboard and had to be dragged back into the ship. So this here is a picture, and this here is the, of the movie. I actually, um, after I got through looking at the, uh, after I got through uh, putting together the presentation, um, I looked at the movie for the first time. I thought I had already seen the movie because it came out in 1997, but um, that was actually my first time looking at the movie, which was a good movie. The movie didn't document everything that happened um, um, that happened uh, during this event. So a lot of this information I'm going to have, I'm, I'm going to have in my, it's, it's in my presentation and it's part one and part two that may, you may not see in the movie. But here is Syncpe that jumped overboard uh, into the ocean and they retrieved him. All right, and here is a picture here or a drawing of Syncpe now is actually um, talking to the uh, his people on side uh, uh, in, uh, on the La Amistad um, uh, after he was retrieved from being overboard and now he's trying to get them to to fight again against these individuals who tried to take over the ship. Hold on. Jumped overboard and had to be dragged back onto the ship. He urged his fellow slaves to fight against hopeless odds and was taken away to America vessels and separated from his men. He made. Hold on. He made such violence a protest that the naval officer allowed him to remain on the Washington deck where he stood and stirred fixed at the Amistad throughout the night, the New York Sun reported. They ended up putting Syncpe, uh, Peace uh, Tawanda, Peace uh, Shawanda, uh, Hotel Damo. Uh, it was in 2011. Uh, and I'll check it out too. Uh, uh, I am my brother's keeper. Uh, uh, peace, peace. Uh, that's his name. Alexander uh, Falconbridge. Appreciate that, uh, Edmund, uh, brother Edmund. Uh, uh, Alexander Falconbridge, just uh, going back, I was talking about earlier about, um, on one of the slides, I was talking about how they was packed in as cans and they had buckets and they had the defecating in buckets and they was chained to each other and some could not cross each other because the chains wasn't re uh, reaching. They had to defecate on themselves. He talked about the diseases uh, that transpired of them being uh, 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 um, down there for a long period of time uh, while they defecated on themselves. Uh, certain types of diseases transpired down there because of the heat. A lot of them suffocate because of the horrendous heat. So I was trying to get to tell you about this individual, Alexander Falconbridge, who also wrote a book, who was also uh, was on a sh on numerous of ships, who was also a doctor, who was there to to uh, help uh, the those that was on board as well as the kidnap. Uh, to make sure that they stayed in shape, shape kept them healthy to end uh, to end up to uh, this auction place on the islands to be sold uh, and, and, and shipped off to numerous uh, numerous places. So Alexander Falconbridge. So you can look him up, or you can go on my page. I, uh, I read a, a couple of inserts out of his books. I talk about him on my African Drums presentation as well. So you can look at uh, either one of those. It's on Kofi Paisa TV. All right. Here are a few of the news clippings here where it talks about um, these Africans um, actually on the uh, long uh, in New York on uh, on the coast of Long Island. So these are just a few snippets that I that I that I took and I put in here just for some more documentations to kind of bag up what I'm saying. He says smoking in Havana deck and the judge from. So I'm not going to even read all of this, but you can go back and you can pause it and you can look at these articles uh, um, of these news clippings where these people actually wrote about these uh, actually people, uh, 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 these uh, Mindy people and a few other people that was not from many that actually revolted on the La Amistad revolt. So these are just a few clippings, newspapers clippings, so you can go back and you can look at this. These are some of the primaries. Peace, peace, uh, Sister Tiffany, peace. All right. Judge Johnson held on. the. OK, this is just so we talk. Judge Johnson Anderson T. Johnson. Judge Johnson held the court on aboard the Washington on August the 29th in New London Harbor, examining the ship documents and hearing the testimony of Ruins and Montez as 
Oh my goodness. Hold on, y'all. Because I think. Uh, oh, no. Hold on. Hold on, y'all. Me, 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 I'm trying to see something. I'm just trying. Okay. I'm Because I got two presentations on here. I'm sorry. Let me go back. Because I don't want to jump into another presentation. Because I want, I only want to talk about was the uh, insurrection of the lobster, Cinque Pei, um, Montez, uh, Ruins, and the judge, and so forth. Let me go back. Okay. So, Judge Johnson held court on board of the Washington on August the 29th in New London Harbor, examining the ship, documents, and hearing the testimony of Ruins and the Montez. This is the time when the USS uh, Washington was uh siege the La Amistad and siege uh the kidnapped victims as well as the two Spaniards as well as uh the cabin boy Antonio that they do not mention but I'm going to mention him in part two because the more research I've done I didn't hear about uh Antonio or even hear about the four the four children that was bought by Montez um the three girls and the one, the one boy, which we, we talk about, I'm going to talk about the one boy, Kel, as they called him, because this brother was, this young brother was very smart, very intellectual. He caught on quick to a lot of things. So he was uh, very vital to uh, the abolish, abolish movement and so forth. Um, uh, ruins and the Montez, as well as their urgent request, the ships and its cargo, including the Africans to be surrendered to the Spanish Council in Boston. Johnson immediately released, so Johnson was on board the ship. This is before the case. I'm not talking about the case. We're going to talk about the case in part two. But he boarded the ship, evaluated, examined the things that was on the ship, and um, so the documents and the hearing the testimony, and hearing the testimony of Ruins and Montez, these are the two Spaniards. We know Ruins bought 49 slaves for $450 each. Montez bought four children, three girls, three girls and one boy for one thousand three hundred dollars, as well as their urgent request that ship is ship all this cargo, including the Africans, be surrendered to the Spaniard consul in Boston. Johnson immediately released Ruins and Montez and ordered the Cinque and others to be tried for murder and piracy at the next session of the circuit court due to opening on September the 17th at the Hartford, Connecticut. The Africans were consigned to the country, jailed in New Haven. So now that Johnson boarded the ship, examined the things and got the testimony from these two wicked Spaniards, he released the Spaniards, right? But he enslaved our ancestors. So he enslaved the people from Sierra Leone. They actually in jailed them in Connecticut. So, and they actually was uh, trying to convict them of murder and piracy. But again, as I mentioned, the Anglo-Spaniard uh, Treaty of 1875 and 1835, it was illegal to kidnap and transport kidnapped victims across the Atlantic shores because Great Britain abolished it in 1807 it went through its chain and then they made a treaty with spain they made a treaty with the dutch they made the treaty with the portuguese they made a treaty with the united states so they abolished trafficking of slaves across the atlantic ocean so you could not go in and kidnap anyone from west africa and bring them across the shores into other different places so they was already breaking the law. They was already breaking the law again for kidnapping human beings in the, in, 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 in the first place. But now these people who broke the law and trafficking human beings across the Atlantic Ocean and these Mindy people, these African people, our great people, uh, uh, created, I mean, uh, took on a revolt and killed the captain, killed one of the cooks took over and seized the ship and tried to set sail back home to their own homeland because they was kidnapped and separated from their family and finna go somewhere and be worked to death to continue to build wealth for these wicked Europeans. So now they, they are now trying, now they are in the United States. We know that once they took the ship over, Montez Cinque Pei 
wanted them to set sail to turn the ship around and head east because they know he knew the sun rises in the east and they was going in a different direction. But at night, the Spaniards would trick them and would turn the ship around and set sail. That's why when I showed you uh, on the map that I cut off the lake zigzag, the ship took a zigzag. They supposed to got to Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico princess in three days. But due to the insurrection on the ship where the, our the, uh, ancestors uh, and this, uh, our fearless ancestors, Singpe, Pei, uh, with the other Mindy people in Sierra Leone took over the ship, they went on this zigzag ride back and forth, which supposed to took three days, ended up they was on the Atlantic Ocean for two months. And prior to them being on the Atlantic Ocean in two months, they landed in New York, which is on the shores of Long Island. And again, they was taken uh, siege by the U.S. Um, uh, 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 um, uh, Washington, which was uh, uh, which was also another ship up under Lieutenant Godley. So now the judge came on to the ship to examine and to get the uh, to uh, to uh, get the test of testimony from these two Spaniards, these wicked Spaniards, and then try to convict these uh, people that they kidnapped for murder and piracy because they was only trying to get back home to where they was because they was kidnapped and took to another foreign place and then sold and now going to a sugar plantation to be worked to death. Meanwhile, Ruins had renamed Cinque to hold Cinque. So this is how he became Cinque. Because again, they set up Montez and Ruins they set up these fraudulent passports and they set up these fraudulent birth certificates. So we know when the Atlantic slave trade jumped off in 1492 and so forth, we know when we was kidnapped, we again, we was kidnapped and we was, we was, they, they stripped us of our names. They stripped us of our native tongue. They stripped us of our culture, our tradition, our spiritual systems, et cetera, et cetera. And again, that's why I say we have black people running around here with the name Billy, Bob, G uh, Jill, Susan, and so forth. We have uh, take, they have taught us to take on the identity of them. So they changed his name to Cinque, and it was a fraudulent birth certificate, and they changed his name for the purpose of they was, uh, they was actually breaking the law on the shores because of the treaty between Great Britain, Spain, the Dutch, the Portuguese and the United States, where they abolished the uh, the kidnapping uh, 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 and trafficking slaves across the Atlantic shores. So they put these fraudulent documents together to in order in case they got stopped um, crossing the Atlantic Ocean. Um, they had these documents that these these uh, kidnapped victims, these Mindy people from Sierra Leone, West Africa, was already in their possession. Slavery was not abolished. We know slavery wasn't abolished until 1863 and officially in 1865, as we thought. Um, but that's a whole other story. But, um, but in 1812, just in, in 1817, or the trafficking, the treaties were set forth. And in 1833, these treaties were set forth for the kidnapping and the trafficking across the Atlantic Ocean. You can have owned slaves, but you couldn't traffic them. You couldn't go and kidnap them anymore and then traffic them across the Atlantic Ocean. Now you had, you now, so if you was to set sail with some people that you had, they had to be already on your plantation, had to be born on your plantation, and now you're moving them to another location or another continent and so forth. And this was not the case for these, these uh, 53, uh, kidnapped victims from Sierra Leone and Liberia that was on the La Amistad at this point of time. They was kidnapped from Africa, from West Africa. They was not born on one of these Spaniards plantations. Now, the abolitionists stepped in. At this time, and this is from the Amistad book, the abolitionists stepped in. And at this time, the U.S. anti-slavery movement was in disarray. With divergent views on several issues, political action, women's rights, Americans. So at this time, uh, in 1839, okay, before 1839, you know, we, we, we began to have these uh, Europeans, these white people um, uh, start to feel a certain group of people that they called the New Awakening that started to take place in the early 18th century. So in the early 18th century, 
we know that we was conquered and we was enslaved up under the banner of Christianity. If you look through majority of my presentations and through the documentations that I have, I have shown you previous to the European coming into Central Africa and into West Africa, we had our own spiritual systems and we was introduced into their systems. So, and I showed you exactly who these people was invoking the name of the spiritual systems and so forth. So now we know, even I showed you with the Portuguese jumping off the Atlantic slave trade, their main uh, our thing was to come into West Africa to rape the people of the natural resources and to convert the people into Christianity. I, I showed this through the documentation, even through some of the documents of coming out of the Europeans' mouth themselves. Now you have in the 18th century, you have these certain Christians that they call the New Awakening. And through the New Awakening, these people are feeling sad because you have a group of people from the 14th, 15th, 16th century that has been kidnapping Africans um, and raping Africans, raping the natural resources over there, murdering Africans, and so forth. Now have been reawakening saying this is not the Christian way. So these people became what they wanted to set up to abolish slavery all the way around the board because slavery was still legal. It was just the trafficking of slaves across the Atlantic Ocean that was, 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 was illegal at this point of time. So the abolishers stepped in, but due this time of them stepping in, they was already in disarray because they couldn't agree on politics, uh, uh, political uh, uh, views. They, come, they had women rights they couldn't agree on. Uh, the American churches, they couldn't have certain things with the philosophies they couldn't agree on. Um, so it was in disarray. But with this event that took place with Singpe, Pei, and the other 49, um, not the other 49, but the other 52 Africans that was on the La Amistad, that revolted in on the Atlantic coast or the Atlantic Ocean, it actually got these uh, abolishers groups back together. The Amistad provided a focal point for rallies of dispersed ranks and abolishness, and they all came out in defense of the captives. Fully convinced of their innocence, they was put forth in the heralds of freedom. This was a newspaper. Cinque is no pirate, no murderer. No felon, because again, they are trying to convict those uh, kidnapped victims, those 53 West, uh, West Africans of murder and piracy for killing the captain and his cook and causing an insurrection on the slave ship called La Amistad because they were trying to liberate themselves, become free, and get back to their home, uh, uh, to their families. So when they set sail and they made it to America, now they are being trying to be crucified by the courts, by our government saying that these people are murderers. And all along, Montez and Ruins, these Spaniards broke the law by going and kidnapping these 53 Africans in West Africa and trafficking them across the Atlantic coast. So these abolishers came to the aid. Once the abolishing movement came to their defense and their aid, they are the ones that started to defend uh, these 53 Africans uh, from Sierra Leone and from Liberia. Cinque, and again, this is not his name. It is Cinque Pei, but we know Montez, I mean, Ruins changed his name because Ruins uh, uh, purchased Cinque Pei and 48 of the West Africans and Montez uh, purchased uh, four uh, children from uh, from West Africa, three girls and one boy. Oh, shoot, excuse me. So Sinque is no pirate, no murderer, no felon. His homicide is justified. Had a white man done it, it would have been glorious. It would have immoralized him. Joseph Sinque, whose name is not Joseph Sinque, his name is Sinque Pei, are not to be tried. Everybody knows he is innocent. He could not be guilty. The paper added that the lieutenant commander, Jignan, this was the lieutenant that was aboard the USS um, Washington, who sieged the La Amistad ship with the other, with the 53 Africans that was on board, was actually, there was less than that. They started out with 53. Two got killed 
why the insurrection or the revolt took place, uh, uh, which was spearheaded by Singpe Pei. So two of the Africans was killed, so they left them with 58. But aboard the ship, the ship only had enough food for a, a supply for a certain amount of days because they was being transported from Cuba to Puerto Rico Princess, which would take three days. But during the insurrection, it took two months because they ended up in the United States because of the revolts and the zigzagging motion of Montez trying to trick them every time Singpei told him to set sail where the sun rises in the east. So they ended up with this zigzagging pattern. Lynn, uh, 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 was on the Atlantic Ocean for two months. So 10 more of the Africans died on the ship due to them not having enough food to feed themselves. So now you, we're subtracting from 58, not 58, but 53, and we're subtracting, uh, there's, there's 12 gone now. So um, the... Uh, had an authority to capture Amistad. She is being a lawful prize of the hapless Africans formerly became the Amistad commi com Committee. Uh, September the 4th comprised of aliens, a Joseph Levitius, editor of the Emancipators, the officer organs of the American Anti-Slavery Society, Reverend Joseph S. J uh, Julian. So out of the abolishers, they started a movement they started a movement called the Amistad Committee, which later became the American Missionary Society. Because we know once these individuals came into Africa, they brought their religion, they, they, they would they conquered us up under the banner of their religion, which was Christianity. And they would bring in their missionaries, their missionaries would spread their gospel. They will indoctrinate our people through the missionaries and them setting up schools where they colonize these different areas in Africa. So the American Missionary Society was very instrumental into freeing the people in Amistad, which also set off some chains of events or some historical events in America as well as in Sierra Leone. But we're not going to talk about those events until we get to part two, which won't be today. But you had the um, uh, Amistad Committee, which later became the American Missionary Society. But right now it is the Amistad Committee by these four abolishers who came to the defense of Sinpei and these other West African uh, individuals that was on the La Amistad. So you have Joseph Le 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 Levitius, who was the editor of the Emancipator of the Official Organs of the American Anti-Slavery Society. Reverend uh, Simon S. Jolius, a white pastor of a black church in New York. Uh, peace, 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 uh, uh, Aruba. Peace, uh, uh, Hotel uh, Brother Robert. Peace, Brother Robert June. Peace, peace, peace to uh, uh, to country. If you're still on here, cuz. Peace, peace, peace to you. Um, I done spoke to everybody else on him. All right. Uh, so you have so now you got Joseph Leviticus, you have uh, the Reverend Simon S. Jones, a uh, white pastor of a black church in New York, and you have Louis Tyden, who is the leader, who actually formulated the Amistad Committee with these other two guys. Louis Tyden, a wealthy New York merchant and a prominent abolisher, Tabby launched the campaign for the defense of the Amistad Africans and issued an appeal to the French excuse me, the friendship of liberty. 38 follow men from Africa having been participate, particularly kidnapped from their native lands, transported across the seas and subjected to atrocity cruelty, cruelty have been thrown upon our shores and are now in, uh, incarcerated in jail. We know that they are being incarcerated because once Judge Johnson came aboard the ship to examining what was on the ship and to get the testimony from the two Spaniards, Montez and Ruins, then he set up a date for them to preside in the circuit court. So, and they was being, and the Africans were being tried for murder and piracy, why the two Spaniards wasn't being tried for nothing. And uh, take it amongst, again, 
they broke the treaty of the Anglo and the uh, the uh, the Anglo and the Spanish treaty of 1817 and 1833. These treaties between uh, the uh, Great Britain, the Dutch, the Spain, Portuguese, and the United States, and they created these fraudulent documents and these birth certificates, trying to say that these people, these 53. Uh, Africans from Sierra Leone and Liberia was already born on the plantation, which they was not born on the plantation. You went into Sierra Leone uh, and, Li and Liberia or the surrounding areas of Mende, and you kidnapped these people. They are ignorant of our language and the uses of the civilized society and the abolish of the Christianity. Oh, all right. The Amistad Committee, as I mentioned, who became the American Missionary Society, who set up missionaries and schools all throughout West Africa. Because we're going to see what the Amistad Committee of the American Missionary Society do once we see what happened. I don't want to give it away if nobody hadn't looked, but we're going to go into the cases. We're going to go into the Amistad case, so the, which is next going to be on part two. The Amistad Committees was founded in 1839 by Lewis Tabby. This is Lewis Tabby. This was the rich merchant. And Joseph Leviticus here and Reverend Joseph, uh, I mean, uh, Simon Father, uh, uh, Jos Josilian, so I'm saying it right, Reverend Joseph Leviticus. So these was the founding members of the Amistad committee which will later become the American Missionary Society. All right. This strong conviction was, however, not enough. The Abashas had to get African versions of the event to obtain counsels to prove their innocence before the circuit court. They had no illusion about the difficulty, so now these Abashas who set up the American committee is coming to the defense of the 53 kidnapped Africans from West Africa aboard this ship called Friendship, a ship called Friendship, which is, is which is La Amistad. And now they are on the shores because they set up an insurrection or revolt and killed the two people on the ship because they wanted to free themselves and to return home because they was kidnapped and was now going to a foreign territory, territory to be worked for free labor. So now the Amistad Committee is trying to figure out some type of uh, how to get some type of legal defense and to set up some type of legal defense in behalf of the 53 uh, kidnapped victims that was on the La Amistad, which when we got here, there was not 53. You remember, two was killed during the insurrection. Two Africans was killed. Then I told you later, it's supposed to took two to three days to get to Port, Port, Puerto Rico prisons. But they stayed on the Atlantic Ocean two months because of the insurrection. And they zigzagged up and down because at the daytime, the Spaniards would set sail where the... Uh, Sinpe Pei, who was uh, uh, from the Mende tribe in West Africa, who led the revolt on the slave ship, wanted them to sail east but at, uh, because the sun rises in the east. But at night, they would turn the ship around. So they zigzagged for two months, and then they ended up in the United States. And the ship only had enough food to last them for a couple of days because they supposed to arrive there in three days, but they was on the Atlantic Ocean for two months because every night, the Spaniard would turn the trip around, tr ship around, and head back the other way. And then in the morning time, the Africans will find out that they have gone off of uh, the course and make them turn around, and eventually ended up in uh, Long Island, on the coast of Long Island in New York, where the ship was sieged by the USS um, uh, Washington up under the Lieutenant Commander uh, Godney, who took over the ship, and Judge, Jot Judge uh, Johnson came aboard, examined the ship, and got the testimony from these two Spaniards who bought these 48, I mean, bought these 53 uh, uh, um, Africans. Now, 
Uh, the day following Judge Johnson's order, the abolishers of New Haven met and wrote to the follow abolishers in New York to check out the validate of the ship documents. Find Africans who can speak the language of the captives and records their own version by finally obtaining quality counsels. The committee formed a defend and to, uh, uh, formed to defend the hapless Africans formally became the Amistad Community Committee in September 4th, comprised Alter Elias, who I gave you the names, such and such. Now, the Defense Council comprised formally of a team of Roger Baldwin, who is this individual here? And you have Seth Staples and Theodore Segwin amongst the best legal minds. So these, the Amistad Committee finally got a defense team together who was Roger Baldwin, who Roger Baldwin, who did all the work. He got advice and sought other counsel from Seth Staples and Theodore Segwick. But it was Roger Baldwin, this individual, who did all the work. Roger Baldwin was a Yale educator, 46 years of age, New Haven lawyer with a reputation for defending unfortunate when he was asked to represent the Africans of the Amistad. He first became associated with the abolishers' cause in 1831 when he confirmed a mob seeking to block constructions and train schools for Negroes in New Haven. Bauman was joined on the Amistad defense team by Theodore Segman and Seth Staples, who later found the Yale Law Schools and a lot of people that was involved in trying to free these Africans who was on the La Amistad who ended up in uh, America um, had, had went to Yale. For some reason, a lot of the so-called intellectual Europeans at this point in time, I always see Cambridge and I always see Oxford. Cambridge University and Oxford. But now I'm starting to see Yale a lot too. So a lot of these individuals are, uh, went, to these, went to this Yale institution. So this guy, I'm not going to read the rest of it, but was actually, well, I'll, I'll read a little bit more. Often there were narrow property laws based arguments, rather, mor uh, morality, broad-based attacks on slavery itself. Baldwin, however, did argue that Ruins and Montez were criminals. But Judge Johnson, when he said, boy, he set them free. He called the Africans that was kidnapped murderers and pirates. But he did not call the Spaniards criminals. He set them free. Then set up a court day to have the Africans convicted of murder or have the Africans return back to Spain to be convicted for murder because they set a revolt up on the La Amistad because they wanted to be free because they was kidnapped. Not the Africans who fought for their freedom. And that two Cubans deserve the penalty of death for piracy. So now he's talking about Montez and Ruins. They also need to be put on trial, you know what I'm saying, for piracy and murder also. Now, this William H. Townsend sketches of the Amistad captains depicted distinction individuals who overpowered their captors aboard the slave ships and later secured the freedoms in the African, I mean, in the American court system. So here are a few sketches. I'm about done with this part of the presentation. Tomorrow, I'm going to do part two on my channel, Kofi Paisa TV. We're going to go into the um, Amistad case. We're going to go into the cases. We're going to show some more primaries in the cases because it's about the primaries. Uh, and we're going to show the historical events that happened because of this revolt of these Africans revolted on this slave ship that these chains of events that took place in America as well as Sierra, uh, Sierra Leone where these people was kidnapped. But these are some sketches that was drawn of some of the kidnapped victims from West Africa um, that was aboard the La Amistad uh, strip. And Fulili and little Gail. Gail is the boy that I was telling you about, the Montez. Montez was the one that purchased four uh, African kids. He purchased three girls and one boy. This boy was Kales right here, who was very smart, who caught on very quick, 
who was very instrumental in the movement once they got to America. He learned how to read English uh, and comprehend things very fast. This was another brother, Fulili, who also caught on very fast. This is one of the girls, Marquis, out of the four girls, the other three girls, with well, the other uh, two girls that was also purchased by Montez. So these are some of the some of the sketches uh, uh, that was drawn that was sketched by this guy William H. Townsend. Uh, here are a few more that was aboard the La Star. You have this individual's uh, Cabrino, who they said was actually second in command up under Singpe Pei on this La Amistad ship. Here are a few other individuals here. You have this individual, uh, unidentified individual here. Uh, they, uh, the sketcher didn't know his name. Uh, and it was some more sketches that I didn't have because I'm missing probably about 10 other uh, individuals. I think this about uh, 20, 22 people, but it was more than that aboard the ship. It ended up with 38. Started out with 53, two got killed. 10, two got killed during the insurrection on the La Amistad. 10 starved to death because they were supposed to have been there three days, but doing through their revolt, they ended up on the waters for two months. Uh, 10 died through starvation because there was enough food on the ship. At that time, it was just enough for the trip. And then later on, we we're going to talk about uh, in the custody uh, in the United States where they was jailed. They were still mistreated while they was in jail. And you had some others that died here on the soils of the United States. Um. Um, we're going to talk about, again, in the next presentation, you got, this is the individual here, Andrew T. Johnson. This was the individual that actually came aboard uh, the La Amistad ship once it was seized by the U.S. Uh, Washington up under Lieutenant Commander uh, uh, Gottney. And once it was seized, he shot a letter to the district attorney and so forth, and they sent Judge Johnson to examine the ship and also get the testimony from the two wicked Spaniards. And he was the one to also deem them the uh, the kidnapped victims from West Africa, our ancestors, to be murderers and pirates and set a court date up in the circuit court. So on the next presentation, we're going to talk about those three cases, those three court cases, the three court cases in the circuit court, the district court and the Supreme Court. So now when we get to September, we're going to talk about the circuit court. They're going to be in the circuit court first. And this is going to be the presiding judge here, Smith Thompson. Then they're going to be, something's going to happen in the circuit court. Then they're going to have to go to the district court. So when they go to the district court, now Judge Johnson, Andrew T. Johnson, is going to be the judge in the district court. Something is going to happen in the district court. Now they're going to have to go to the Supreme Court. And this is the judge here, Joseph Stories. And we'll talk about these individuals a little bit more in the presentation part two, the uh, Amistad Revolt and the, fear, and the Fearless Sing Pei uh, Pei presentation part two. Um, here are my uh, sources here. I'll leave it here for a few minutes for you to look at the sources, plenty of sources. I got some more on the other pages. Like I said, I might have had about 26 sources on this, uh, 26 sources. I've been reading my butt off, been researching, been trying to find information on this. This presentation was led by my last presentation, the Bundo slash Sandy, a secret woman society where I put peace, peace of Sister Julia, where I deal with the women's secret society. If you haven't looked at that, go look at it. I talk about the people uh, in Sierra Leone, as well as Liberia, as well as Ghana. I talk about the people in Mende. I talk about the Cerebrum people. I talk about the Timne people, the Gala people. I talk about the Va uh, people, the Kono people, the Kenne people. So I talk about all these different people that was involved in the secret woman society, but I specifically deal with the Mendy people and just doing research on the Mendy people, Singpei Pei fell in my lap. So I started to do some research on the Amistad revolt that happened on the Atlantic Ocean. Here are some more of my uh, 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 references uh, here. Uh, so I keep that up there for a few minutes. So you have a whole page that I just showed, and then you have a few here uh, on this page of uh, um, of, of references and sources uh, that I use here. All right. Um, 
please go subscribe to the Sessu Ma'ami Meta Netter. This is the Sessu Ma'ami Meta Netter banner. I am a member of the Sessu Ma'ami uh, Meta Netter group. We are a group of like-minded individuals who indulge in the language, which is called Runny Kimmet, and the writing system, which is called the Sesh uh, Metter uh, Netter. Uh, so please go subscribe to our channel. We have uh, uh, bukus of presentations where we actually transliterate and translate uh, the glyphs. Um, we talk about uh, the history. We talk about the culture and the traditions of Kemet what y'all call Egypt. Um, also go subscribe to Kofi Paisa TV. This is a new channel. This is my channel. It's been up for uh, maybe four or five months. Uh, appreciate the support that I'm getting now. Um, so please go subscribe to that channel, um, which tomorrow I'll be doing part two, where I'll be actually going into the case, uh, the case one, which deals with the district court, case two, which deals with the district court, case three, which deal with the Supreme Court, and then after they are free after the Supreme Court, um, what happened uh, after they was freed, what happened when they got home, um, what happened, they set out these events in Africa, what happened to these individuals uh, um, that actually came back and set up institutions, what are these institutions, and so far, y'all, don't want to miss that one, uh, that's tomorrow on my channel. Um, also, go subscribe to Masi Warrior Clan, which I'm also a member of. Uh, please go subscribe to that channel. We have some presentations up now. The Sandy slash Bundo slash Sandy Secret Woman Society is on that channel, as well as Kofi Paisa TV. Um, a few other my presentations is on the Masi Warrior channel. Um, be looking forward to the uh, Gala, uh, uh, the Gala Geechee presentation. Uh, that would also be on that channel, which I hadn't started on it yet, um, which will be, I'm, I'm going to try to connect the Gala people that's in Sierra Leone and the Gala people that was in Angola to the Gala Geechee people that is in South uh, South Carolina, the Gala Geechee people. So um, I have some research to do on that. I'm actually going to start on that tomorrow and be looking forward for that presentation as well as the Poro presentation by Brother uh, Brother Ben, um, uh, he will be uh, pre uh, presenting uh, the Poro uh, Secret Man Society because I did the Secret Woman Society, which is the Bundo slash Sandy, which is in Sierra Leone, uh, Liberia. But in Sierra Leone and Liberia, the men have a secret society called the Poro Society. So he will be doing a presentation on the Poro, the Poro Men Secret Society. But go check out that Bundo. So that's a good presentation. I enjoy putting that presentation together for the women. So go check out that. We had a few issues uh, doing a presentation for the issues. Uh, we I know people is uh, not going to agree because I'll be a fool to think that everybody is going to agree with everybody. I don't mind people voicing their opinion. Um, so I talked about a few. One of the things was circumcision. If you go look at it, if you hadn't looked at it with circumcision, people have um, issues with circumcisions. I provided some information on that. Um, um, some articles before I got back into the presentation so people can go do some thorough research, also do some thorough research on the Sandy people or the Zoe or the Zoesas who were the leaders, the teachers who were also skilled in medicine, who was also skilled in the female body, who was also skilled um, in herbs and so forth. Also with the uh, officer up under her, the Ligba. So do some research on those individuals as well as circumcisions and so forth, because I know people have some issues with women being circumcised and so forth, but it's a good presentation. Um, I think that kind of outshadowed it a little bit due to some of the comments, but we got past that and we went into rock and roll and we went through the rest of the great things that these women did and uh, uh, did and so forth. But so please support us. Go subscribe to the uh, Set Shoot channel. Go subscribe to my channel. Go, and I will immediately upload this presentation there and then tomorrow part two will be on there and go so, uh, subscribe to Master Warrior channel. Any Haret Sean Calfani, which is my brother from another mother, he has presentations on the Master Warrior clan. Be looking forward for, he has two presentations that he's working on that's also going to be on the Master Warrior clan, as well as my Gullah slash Gullah Geechee, where I'm going to be connecting or trying to connect the people in Angola, which is in Central Africa, which is called Nidungo. And Nidungo, the people in Nidungo and the people that is in uh, 
that is actually in uh, Sierra Leone and Liberia called the Gala, uh, uh, um, um, or the Gala Gichi people in South America descendants from the Ndongo people that we call Angola, which is in Central Africa, as well as the people in West Africa. So be looking forward to uh, those presentations and join me tomorrow uh, around the same, maybe around 6.30, 7 o'clock, Kofi Paisa TV. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe now. Hit the bell. I appreciate y'all. Uh, and on that note, I want to say Shimim Hotep. I want to say Madupe, Dupe Pupu, which means many thanks. Moriwi, which means um, appreciate. Dua, Dua U, means thank you or thank you uh, very much um, for rocking out with me. I hope this was an informative presentation. I hope uh, uh, y'all enjoyed the presentation. I hope y'all do some uh, further research on the, the Mindy people because the Mindy people uh, have a great history. I enjoy finding out about the Mindy people in Sierra Leone, Liberia, as well as Ghana, due to the Sandy Bundo presentation, which got me to this presentation with the majority of the people in the La Amistad was the Mindy people and Singpe Pei, who actually orchestrated the revolt, is from Sierra Leone, and he's a part of the Mindy tribe. So on that note, I want to say peace. I want to say a bit for Houdie, and I want to say Black African power. Man in the full knowledge of himself is a superb and supreme picture of creation. When man becomes possessor of the knowledge of himself, he becomes master of his environment, the captain of his own ship, the director of his own destiny, the accomplisher of his own ends. Man should understand himself because man is full of knowledge, and this knowledge is a gift of nature. When Mother Nature created man, she deprived him of nothing. He was given the faculty of understanding all things around him. His faculty for understanding has not been taken away from him. None of his senses have been taken away from him. So there is no excuse for the black man. Bridging my team, red, black, and green, queen, the king, salute, now scream, I shake, scream from the other I shake, I'm ripping my team, red, black, and green, queen, the king, salute, now scream, I shake, scream from the other I shake, five, I'm ripping my team, I shake, Majube Iba E, Egungun Kiki, Egungun.